Good evening and welcome. You are all filing into the virtual room of our event this evening. Um, no jostling. And uh, for those of you who are, who are just entering, can I just say how excited we are at the size of the crowd this evening. Um, they're just numbers filling up on the screen, but if you would like to say in the chat box where you are zooming in from, we'd love to know. Um, and uh, I, might, I might wait a little while to give my, my big reveal, well, other than the fact that we have a lineup of three brilliant women this evening, but the response to tonight's event was so great that, um, yeah, here's my, here's my big fact. Some of, many of you have been to Housemans, perhaps some of you never have, but if all of us were there this evening, instead of looking at a black square, there would be enough of you this evening to fill Housemans to the rafters eight times over. So thank you to all of you who have joined us, who have shown your support for independent and radical publishing and booksellers. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's gonna be a big crowd. So thank you so much. Now, people are still filing in, um, but uh, maybe I'll get cracking. So we have a wonderful lineup for this evening. My name is Karen Shook and I'm your chair for tonight. And uh, obviously the best way to start is with some words of thanks. So first of all, thanks to all of you. Thanks to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, it's, uh, it's incredibly heartening to see what the response was to our protest. Um, stories of resistance evening. This is the second of our evenings. Last night we gave a big break to an unknown actor named Christopher Eccleston um, and uh, with Martin Bedford, a writer, and Dave Waddington, an academic. Um, and I think you already know uh, who we are seeing tonight. I also need to say thank you to Becca, Zoe, and Ra from Comma Press who've co-organized the events last night and tonight. Comma Press, well, in a word, they're brilliant. Uh, they're a not-for-profit publisher based in Manchester and specializing in the short story. And in 2020, Comma Press won Small Press of the Year in the North of England at the British Book Awards. Comma Press also works as a writer development agency, delivering short story courses and conferences that help to give writers, publishers, and translators access to advice, knowledge, and skills. And in 2016, Comma Press founded the Northern Fiction Alliance, a radical publishing collective showcasing the creative, diverse, and outward-looking publishers in the north of England. They are also the publishers of the History into Fiction Anthologies protest, which we featured last night and tonight, and I'm going to do the home shopping channel bit here, um, and the successor, Resist. Now, these are, these are brilliant anthologies. I, I don't know why someone hadn't thought of this before. So collections of fiction plus essays that pair authors with experts and witnesses. If you've ever read historical fiction and thought, is Wikipedia gonna really tell me the backstory to this? These books um, provide the answer and the insights. Um, they look at key moments of British protest and defiance over the last two millennia, from Boudicca to Blair Peach, from Cable Street to Grenfell, and from the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 to the anti-Iraq War demo of 2003. And of course, there are a few other people I need to thank tonight. Actor Maxine Peake is with us, writer Maggie G, and Professor Sally Alexander, feminist scholar and icon. Three icons, an overused word, but believe me, I feel like using it tonight. Um, all three of these women have generously given their time and their talent to support radical, progressive, and independent publishing and book selling in a very difficult time. And I think you know what I mean. Um, and finally, I should say a word from our sponsor. Although Houseman's physical doors are currently shut, the virtual doors of our online shop remain open. Um, not everyone's working on site at the minute, so shipping your order might take a little longer than usual, but we're really grateful for your patience and understanding and your support. So now, what's gonna happen tonight? Well, we're delighted, just like, yeah, have I said we're delighted? We're delighted to have Maxine join us for the start of the evening. She's going to read from May Hobbs, which is a short story by Maggie G that is part of this anthology, Protest, Stories of Resistance. So I think you're really gonna like it. It's a story about courage, 
It's about class. It's about women. It's about solidarity and it's opposite. Oh, and it's about a golden ruby Russian ring. Um, and because this is an excerpt from the story, if you want to know more about the ring, about who owned it, why it vanished and who ended up owning it, you gotta buy the book. Um, this story is set in 2016 and it looks back to the London night cleaners strike of 1972 in which May Hobbs, a Hoxton born working class woman played a key role in events that highlighted issues like justice and work and how you're paid and inequality and, and women's work. And they're still salient today. Um, after Maxine's reading, um, that will be followed by a conversation between Maggie and Sally and then me kind of sticking my oar in and putting my hand up about issues like economies of care and, and, and women's work, unskilled labor and what that means about organizing, about resistance, about dreams denied and the persistence of determination and hope. And then uh, toward the end of the evening, we'll have an opportunity for you to be part of the discussion via our Q&A session. So you guys have probably done Zoom before. There's a chat box where you can say hi or anything um, that you would like, but if you have a question, pop it in the Q&A box at the bottom center of your screen. And while I'm admiring these awesome women, I'll be having a look over and checking out the questions. So. One last bit from me before we get to the good stuff. That's where I tell you who Maxine Peake is <laughs> for anyone who might not know. I'm not sure there's many here. Um, Maxine is a feminist, a socialist, a patron of Comma Press and a really kind and loyal friend to us here at Houseman's Books and to many other people and organizations. Born in Bolton, now living in Salford after a detour via London. You know, we've all had one of those. Um, Maxine trained at RADA, and she's had a prolific, acclaimed, and genre-spanning career in theater, television, radio, film, activism. Anyone who's encountered Maxine's work will probably feel like I did, which is that regardless of the setting or the story, her performances are intelligent and fearless and always compelling. You know, we'd need a much longer evening to cover the highlights of those roles. I'm sure you all have your favorites. But of course, it would only be right to mention her roles in films such as The Theory of Everything, Funny Cow, Mike Lee's wonderful Peter Liu, in television programs like Silk and Shameless, Dinner Ladies, The Village and Three Girls, and on stage, amazingly on stage, Strindberg's Miss Julie, Beckett's Happy Days, the amazing Carol Churchill's The Scriper, Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire. And in common with one of our guests last night, a promising young northerner named Christopher Eccleston, Maxine has played the title role in Hamlet. Maxine, thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you. That was amazing. That's the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> okay. Just go. One second, sorry. Can I just say what an honour it is as well to be here to um, support Houseman's and Comma and obviously um, to read this fabulous piece by Maggie. So May Hobbs, three generations of women live in a house together in a seaside town. The grandmother, who we only know as Ma, clean for a living and has a political past. Her clever daughter, Anna, is also a cleaner, which is disappointing to Ma and Kim, the granddaughter, is 11. Ma is doing an open university degree in politics. Anna is bored with politics and fed up of living with her mother. It's a few weeks before the American election of 2016 that elected Donald Trump. Anna is reading a tattered Vogue, which has a feature about travel writing. Something has enraptured her. A paragraph about the last remaining virgin forest in Siberia. Birch, larch, shivering poplar. In her mind, she stands there, silent. But her mother is going on from the kitchen. May Hobbs, she's like a watchword for me. Oh, I've heard enough about May Hobbs, sighs Anna, as the white leaves shiver. Everyone should know about May Hobbs, she said. We had rights just like the blimmin' men. Anna leaves the Siberian forest. 
And I think some other has got worse since she started her OU degree. All information makes her indignant. The weather, the gap between rich and poor, and now Trump standing for president. Besides, it's influencing Kim, who is only 10, but getting stroppy. Let's put the TV on. Anna grabs the remote. But there he is, the yellow gold quiff, Trump's bloated face stirring down at the crowd. That man's a wolf, her mother says. You think he's funny, but we won't be laughing. Anna writes poems and lives with her mother because financially it makes sense. Her mother helps out with Kim, of course, but Ma has a lot of coursework for a degree, politics, philosophy and economics. Ma likes to say the words. Her essay this month is on politics of protest. May Obbs is going to get dragged in. Anna laughed out loud when Ma told her the title. You'll get a distinction. You're always protesting. They bicker gently, mother and daughter, and sometimes savagely, about Kim. At the moment, it's the US election. Stop going on, Anna begs her. Obviously, Trump won't win. But Ma believes her daughter is clueless. He's going to win because he's a celebrity. You just don't care, your old generation. Have you changed the world, Ma? At least we tried. I haven't given up and nor should you. Could I change the world? Kim asks from the sofa, where she's trying to do her homework. No, says Anna. Yes, says Ma. The house they share is a Georgian terrace, which was totally gutted by the council in the 80s. Ma bought it cheap as a sitting tenant. She had expected Anna to move. Her clever daughter, her daughter the poet, away and upwards overseas. Flying, flying far from Seabridge, with jobs, doctorates, fame, riches. Ma reminds her of this sometimes, and Anna is always quick to reply. Well, you wouldn't want me to be rich, because then I'd be an exploiter, right? A few million might come in handy. But Anna is dreamy and a cleaner, like Ma. Ma isn't happy that Anna is cleaning, but that is because she's old-fashioned, as Anna kindly explains to her. It's a normal thing. Lots of other friends do it. We could have good jobs, but we prefer this. It's, it's not like you. It, 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 it's not forever. And yet Anna is 33. Day by day can turn into forever. Today, Anna's off for an interview with this new lady, as Ma calls her, scornfully. A woman recently moved down from London. Irina Nemeskova is indeed a lady. Her great-grandparents came to England after the Russian Revolution, having survived a flight through Europe during which they lost all their money. The family hated Bolsheviks, so Arena, by the blind logic of opposites, has become a left-leaning academic and writer. She would rather not have a cleaner, but she's lazy, she laughs, and she can afford one. So why not? So far, she hasn't had a good morning. She's writing an article about 1970s activism. She knows her stuff. She used to teach it. But the voice to write it in, that eludes her. She's read May Hobbs' memoir, Born to Struggle. She's watched Night Cleaners, the black and white film about the office cleaners who came out on strike in 1972. She rereads the transcript of what they said. One particular exchange burrows inward. After a bit, she copies it out. Voiceover. What would socialism mean to you, cleaners? Well, it's the life of people. Yeah, it, it's a lie for the working class people, if that was possible. But that wouldn't be, could it? It couldn't be. The way they talked, the way they hoped. What if a writing can catch that? It's a relief when the doorbell rings. Oh, yes, of course, the girl for the job. Hello, I'm Anna. The girl's shaking off rain. Intelligent face. A bit round-shouldered. Uh, come in the warm, Irina says. 
Soon Anna's balanced on a gilt armchair. Do you have children? Arena asks. One girl, ten. That, that's why I'm doing this, so I can be there for her. Anna smiles a virtuous smile. Arena's sizing Anna up. Should she ask about her education? She didn't need it, though, to clean. I have a lot of books. I, I don't expect you to dust them. The most important thing is not to touch the ones on the table, the, the ones I'm actually writing about. Are you a writer? I like books. I'm writers. Mum's always saying I should have been a writer, but I didn't go to university. You don't need to go to university to be a writer. I still write poems, but Anna can see Irina has lost interest. If you want to write, just go for it, Irina says with an air of finality. Easy enough for you to say, Anna thinks, concealing irritation with a grateful smile. You want me to be your cleaner, not a writer. You want to keep writing while I clean your loo. The woman, adds Irina, indicating the paperback laying face down on the walnut table with a smiling, sturdy woman on the cover, wrote a brilliant book about her life and she had no education to speak of. She was a cleaner, like you. Her voice trails off, the girl's face almost hostile. I think of myself as someone who cleans, Anna says, with a spurt of animation. Yes, says Irina, not understanding. Not a cleaner, Anna explains. I don't define myself as a cleaner. I do lots of things. We're all, you know, in the gig economy. So I'm not, you know, just a cleaner. I see. But a cleaner was what Irina wanted. Y you do like cleaning, though, she probes. It's not a fucking hobby, Anna thinks. But of course. She replies, I like to do a good job. How much do you pay? She blurts out slightly rudely. After an infinitesimal pause, the woman names a sum one third above the going rate. That'll be fine, Anna says quickly. Did you see that monstrous thing Trump said? Irina asks as Anna dallies on the doorstep. Oh, him? He's nuts, Anna says happily. We don't need to worry about him. See you soon. Have a good weekend. Arena goes back to reading May Hobbs, Born to Struggle. What was she like? Ma asks later that day. She and Anna are watching TV. What's who like? The woman, your interview. Oh, all right. Good money. Feels guilty. I know the type. Can't be bothered with them. She was okay. The house was lovely. Lots of books. Political. Political? Do you mean you, Kip? Socialist. Doesn't like Trump. Ma chokes on a pizza. Personally affronted. She is the political one. Hypocrite, she says with her mouth open to martyr on her upper lip. Well, I like her, Anna says untruthfully. Maybe we'll be friends, she adds for good measure. Pigs might fly, Ma says with finality, but stung with jealousy, as Anna intends. Three weeks went by, which meant nine hours at Arena's. Everything was going smoothly. In fact, Arena seemed quite nice and thanked Anna profusely each time she left. Arena, for her part, thought it was working. In the third week, though, something slightly odd happened. She found Anna sitting on the landing with a page of Arena's notes in her hand. The girl had jumped up like a guilty rabbit. Just having a tiny rest, she said. I, I was reading this. It was the sheet on which Irina had cop copied the haunting paragraph from the transcript. A new life for the working class people. But, but it wouldn't be, could it? It couldn't be. It would be asking for the moon. I like the words, Anna explained. Well, you're welcome to copy it out just as soon as you finished cleaning. By the time she was finished, it was long gone lunchtime. See you next Wednesday. Anna smiled, her best smile. Thank you so much. That'll be US election day. No, the day we get the results. Oh, honestly, <laughs> one is slightly nervous. Americans are lunatics, Anna asserted. No worries. Anna and Ma were soon rowing again. 
they made up by watching The Apprentice. But then it was the news and Trump was on. The BBC had photos from inside Trump Tower. The doors were solid gold and everything gleamed. Anna gazed transfixed at the screen. But Trump had ruffled a lot of feathers by praising Putin's actions in Syria. Switch it off! Marsh shouted scornfully. That man is a murderer. What's wrong with him being friends with Putin? I don't want Kim to get blown up, said Anna. Why will I get blown up? They had forgotten Kim was in the room. Is Donna really a murderer? Take no notice of Grandma, said Anna. Stop eating sweets and go to bed. She should know about Putin and Trump, Ma asserted. It's not appropriate, Anna shouted. She really shouted, so this was quite shocking. She should know things, Ma insisted. We've got the American election next week. She's a little girl, Anna shrieked. I'm not a little girl, Kim said, Kim said stoutly. Why do you always take your grandma's side? When Wednesday arrived, Anna got up early and found Kim crying in the bathroom. The truth came out. A boy at school had stuck his pencil in a neck during maths, which Kim was very good at. No one did anything, so Kim thumped him and ended up in the head teacher's office. I don't want to go to school, she sobbed. They sat and cuddled on the landing. Anna kissed the hot, greasy top of her head. Then Ma burst from the bedroom with a bright red face clutching a blurring radio. You won't believe it! You won't believe it! And stomped into the bathroom, slamming the door. Kim, stop crying. What's the matter, Grandma? Anna stood up to go downstairs. As she took the first step, the bathroom door opened and her mum yelled, Trump's bloody won! Anna spun round and missed a step. The shoddy 1980s banisters crumpled and she plunged headlong with an unearthly scream landing on her right shoulder. Oh, I've got to go to work, she kept on wailing as the paramedics checked her over. The young man focused on her collarbone. We'll have to take you in, I'm afraid. This is why, when at 10am, Irina opens the front door, headachy from the misery of the US election. She's surprised to find a hot-eyed old woman and a fat, pretty child standing on her doorstep. Are they Jehovah's Witnesses? But it's Ma, who leaves Irina in no doubt. I've come to clean the place. I've come to clean in place of my daughter. She's fell downstairs and broke a collarbone. This one's off school, indicating Kim, but she hasn't got anything infectious. Okay. Okay, says Arena. Her headache sharpens. It, it, it's, it's, it's not necessary for you to clean. Very, very kind, but, but honestly. However, Ma has screeched over the threshold. I'll get on with it. I brought my kit. Have you got a telly for her to watch? Kim hesitates, then takes a cue from Grandma. Where's the TV? For my education. Arena follows them, twisting her hands. Have they come to rob her home? She moves a laptop into her study, but leaves Mayor Hobbs book on the drawing room table. She can't work. She can't settle. She hears Ma banging about downstairs. Is it even true that Anna's had an accident? Arena decides she must go down and face them. Otherwise, the strange pair will stay forever. But when she opens the drawing room door, she sees Ma standing motionless, outlined against the light through the lace curtains. This book, Ma says. She sounds puzzled and accusing. This book on the table, how did you get hold of it? Is she suggesting Irina stole it? I bought it, obviously, Irina says stiffly. Did Mayobs, did she actually write it? Ma is cautious. She's out of her depth. Yes, it's her autobiography. Is that fiction? No, of course not. Why are you interested in May Hobbs? Well, I knew her, didn't I? Says Ma. It's a common name, not the same one. It's the same one, 
who led the strike, says so are you, against the government, Ministry of Defence, for one, I did know what she was... All right. You actually knew her. Arena can't believe it. The same May Hobbs who led the clean strike now realises she has an advantage. Irina's staring at her as if she is Jesus. Yeah, I was in it. I was part of it. I don't know if she put our names, but I was one of them, the night cleaners. Well, this is extraordinary. There is a pause in which they gaze at each other, seeing each other for the first time. Ma starts talking and can't stop. Would you like to sit down? Irina interrupts her, but deferentially, and, and tries to take away a duster, then points her ceremoniously towards the chaise long. We used to have one of those, Ma says. It wasn't comfy. Found it in a junkyard. It, it actually belonged to my grandmother. We were very fortunate. My, my family was Russian. Irina waves apologetically round the room. Russian Revolution, brilliant country. Ma is starting to feel happy. Quite, says Irina. I must make you a coffee. No one told me May had written a book. How did the educated keep that to themselves? In hospital, the sheets are white and clean. They have kept Anna in in case she has concussion, but she'll be allowed to go home soon. However, Anna is in no hurry. She loves the hospital's antiseptic smell. She is dreaming of never having to clean again. It's a very strange job, really, she thinks. I do things other people shrink from doing. They prefer not to know about. What they want from me is magic. She gets out a notebook and starts writing. What is it we do? It's... She has to pause and then she knows it's miraculous. A woman comes slowly into the ward with a big spray and starts spraying the surfaces. She is small and bowed in her overall and looks as though a million years ago she came from China or the Philippines and has been here for another million. Nobody looks her in the eye or says hello or please or thank you. She is bowed so low she is almost on the floor. Anna's looking down from her high, hard bed. Something suddenly grows from her centre, unfurls like the tongue of a amaryllis towards the woman who never looks up, a green gold thread, a magical tendril. Anna floats around the room beside her. I am a cleaner like her, Anna thinks. All of us women, cleaning and cleaning, and everyone looks down on us. I pretend they don't, but I know they do. Thank you, she suddenly calls to the woman who flinches and frowns, craning up to hear. I'm a cleaner too, Anna says louder, and the tiny woman gives a tiny nod. Anna returns to the voice in her head. What is it we do? It's miraculous. We make time run backwards. That's what we do. The kid's sticky fingers didn't touch the banister. The dying man didn't piss on the floor. The drunk dad didn't spill his beer. That's what we do. We undo touch. We're special people, time travellers. We're here to make the world new again. There are thousands of us, hundreds of thousands, all over the world. There must be millions. If we all stood together in one place, we'd make a whole country, a continent, all standing up like trees in the sunlight. Birch trees, yes, silver and clean, 
like the trees in that Siberian forest, thousands of miles of birch forest, untouched by anyone, untrodden. No one could get to us altogether, and it would be cold and fresh and bright. Nothing dirty anywhere near us, just standing in the sunlight altogether, all the cleaners in the world, the straightest now in the light, the cleanest. And there would be a life for us, a better life. Could it be? Could it? Kim comes sprinting down the ward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxine, for that wonderful reading. Thank you. Now we're going to um, offer you the opportunity to sneak down into the audience in the dark and sit in the third row while we have a conversation with Sally and Maggie. Thank you again so much, Maxine. Um, of course, I now have to introduce two more wonderful women who are joining us. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce you to the writer of the story, Maggie G, and to the acclaimed academic and feminist who was there in the era of the night cleaners strike and much more besides and the struggles that this story points to. Maggie G, another person who probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give it a go anyway. Um, Maggie is professor of creative writing at Bath Spa University and a wide ranging stylistically compelling writer. Her 15 books to date span subjects, centuries and worlds and they include highlights such as The Ice People, My Cleaner, The White Family, which was shortlisted for the International Impact and Orange, now Women's Prize, um, The Blue Collection of Stories, Virginia Woolf in Manhattan, and most recently an angry thriller about pre-Brexit Britain called Blood. And that was on Sunday Times Best Literary Novels and Best Summer Reading Lists in 2019. Hilary Mantel said that Blood was an astonishing book, um, funny and fierce, written with style and dash, without fear. Maggie's work has been translated into 15 languages, and many of you will know, who know her work will know she's been warning against climate change in her fiction since Where Are the Snows in 1991, and her next novel, The Red Children, which will be published by Saki in January 2022, imagines Neanderthals, the climate change refugees 55,000 years ago, appearing in the present, fleeing global warming on the south coast of the UK. Our other guest this evening is, yeah, it's a true honor, Sally, to welcome you. Sally Alexander is Professor Emerita of Modern History at Goldsmiths University of London and the founding editor of the History Workshop Journal. She began her career as an actor, as a teenager, and her scholarly focus includes not only feminism and history, but social movements, memory, and psychoanalysis. And her books, as many of you will know, include Becoming a Woman and other essays in 19th and 20th century feminist history, and most recently, History and Psyche, Culture, Psychoanalysis, and the Past, edited with Barbara Taylor. Sally was part of a courageous generation of women who thought, wrote, argued, organized, leafleted, walked, marched, joined forces and built alliances, questioned and resisted. We all owe them a debt. She was one of the key figures in the first national UK women's liberation movement conference held at Ruskin College, Oxford in 1970. She was a member of several groups in the London Women's Liberation Workshop and she participated in the demonstration around the 1970 Miss World pageant, among many others. And I have to say that for those of you who have heard part of Maggie's story this evening, read by Maxine, but have yet to receive your copy of the book, um, uh, Sally's gripping afterwards to this story is for my money, one of the best things written about the time, the place and the struggles it describes. I, I really can't recommend it highly enough. Um, so we now have an opportunity, I have an opportunity to be sticking my oar in, uh, in a discussion between two brilliant women. Thank you so much. Um, one, th one thing I wanted to throw out as, as we begin talking about this story and about the issues it discusses is that 
protest is a is a unique experiment as an anthology where um, to for our understanding of history and struggle um, pairing a writer and a witness or a scholar by a two pieces on a single moment and a struggle. Um, Sally, I know that your piece was written, I believe, after reading Maggie's story. Uh, is that, and I just wondered what, what you thought about it as a piece of fiction and also as a reflection on the, on the time. Well, I, unfortunately, I missed most of Maxine's wonderful reading of Maggie's story. So um, my impressions are, you know, from memory and are very fragmented, but I loved the story. I thought it was wonderful and very evocative and very present because I still know, uh, well, until very recently, two or three of the cleaners, but now that we, that we worked with in the 70s. So that sense of generation and uh, rediscovering and the layering of history and the layering of experience and the class differences and the kind of passion with which Maggie evokes the meaning of, of cleaning and what it, what it just means to care in that way and to do that kind of work and its undervaluation is terribly present um, today still because the campaign to organize night cleaners is very much within living memory. And as I say, I'm still, I live around the corner from someone who um, I met through that, through that camp, through leafleting the shell building in Waterloo uh, at, in, the 19, in the early 1970s. So I loved Maggie's story. I thought it was wonderful and very, very evocative. But I was asked to write about the campaign itself. So I, I had to do quite a lot of work trying to remember what it had meant. Your piece is very vivid. I felt as though um, of all, all the things that, that you described, um, being aware of the differences between um, the cleaners, how they pulled up, how their lovers or husbands dropped them off, how some would speak to you and some wouldn't, how you were yes. aware of how your voices and your hair and your clothes were different to them. And um, Maggie, I, I, I wonder what you thought reading um, Sally's um, piece, um, because of course I, I imagine that, you know, I know that you used the Night Cleaners film and also May Hobbs book um, to inform your fiction. Um, there must have been things in Sally's piece as well that really struck you. Yeah, I mean, I was amazed. I felt a bit like Ma did when she discovered that, um, <laughs> I mean, sorry, like Irena does when she found out that Ma was in the strike. I was just so impressed. Um, but I, I didn't read Sally's piece before I wrote the story. Um, Born to Struggle is, by the way, I do recommend it. It's out of print. Somebody should bring it back into print. But May Hobbs, probably to, uh, together with somebody I should think, but it, it catches her voice, it catches the trouble yeah. she went through. Um, and, you know, it was a huge, you know, it's an awful lot nicer to be a writer writing about that struggle than it was to be one of those cleaners working incredible hours from 10 through till, 10 through till three, I think, 10 to six in the morning. Uh, and then a lot of them went home and they got breakfast for their families sent the kids off to school. They maybe caught a few hours of sleep. Then they started getting tea and then maybe supper for their husband and then off they went again. So, you know, um, I think I felt very strongly about it because uh, I, for a brief while I, I, I did that job. I lived in a house where I felt completely trapped um, doing that job um, and of course, it's very fascinating because, in a way, cleaners are ignored and, you know, they're talked about in stupid ways. Women who would never do the cleaning themselves are very picky about their cleaners, which always drives me nuts. Yes. You know, do the, you know the women who say, if I, of course, and I just think, yeah, you wouldn't. And now they're doing it. So I hope they like it. Um, um, but anyway, um, it was an amazing strike and it was really not known about widely at the time. I mean, Sally, you know, 
that you were right there on the front line, weren't you? And it was, must have been so interesting, that whole dynamic of getting the women to trust you. And of course, the male trades unionists were not supportive enough, were they? They find no. <laughs> so and then you came along and you were really, truly sympathetic, but they didn't know quite what to make of you at first, did they? So it... No, they absolutely didn't. And and uh, May May Hobbs uh, was a cleaner, and she'd uh, and she'd been trying to organise the cleaners, and she'd been blacklisted for putting the demands of the clean night cleaners um, to her employers. And so she called in. She had a brainwave one day and decided to call in the women, call on the women's liberation movement, and she went to her local group in Hackney and so the word spread and that's how um, I got involved but it was a very long troubled complex and complicated campaign and one of the reasons why it was so difficult was because just as today there is something like at least between a quarter and a half of a million cleaners night cleaners in London still today. And anyone can walk outside and see in, in the middle of the night or in the early hours and see the lights on in buildings and there'll be cleaners in there. And they're very hard to organize and they don't, and there's a constant supply of poor, well now today it's mostly migrants and often illegal migrants who are working for very very little pay on very low contracts and very low hours um, and that was how it was in the early 70s so it was terribly difficult to organize but the thing that was so wonderful was that may so hilarious if it wasn't so sort of sad and tragic was that may had done all this work organizing the night cleaners had built up a a cleaners action group had recruited you know about a hundred women into the um into the cleaners into the cleaners branch and done that again and again on different buildings throughout london across london and um uh, it fluctuated but you know she built up uh, she built up a real a really large substantial number of women and all she got from the trades union le male trades union leaders well it's not really a job anyone could do it it's got no skill you know you're hitting your head against a brick wall loves it's um it's uh, it's uh, too difficult to organize you. And if you watch the Night Cleaners film, some of that conversation is is recorded there, you know, or oh, it's 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 too difficult. It's too difficult to organize you. So it was very demoralizing that that they wouldn't they wouldn't cooperate because cleaners apparently don't have a skill um we could all do it oh. but funnily enough this morning when i walked out of my house early this morning in the in the ice which i promised my children i wouldn't do in case i fell over and broke my ankle but i did i walked the first group of people i bumped into were three people carrying mops and plastic buckets and carrier bags filled with cleaning things. And as I walked around the corner in Pimlico, where I live, they walked into a building. And when I'd been round for my walk and came back, they walked out and walked into another building. So I thought, gosh, how extraordinary that I should see that group of cleaners kind of, and they weren't speaking English, otherwise I would have gone up to them and said, where have you been cleaning and where are you going? They didn't have a van, they were, the, they were walking on foot. Yes. I don't know what that tells you, it's just a story. <laughs> no, but it does tell you that you know, the world hasn't changed enough. I, no. I, I try to make the story have a positive feel, um, and it ends with that, you know, I, it was an affirmation that was saying, it is possible because it's up to everybody and everyone who reads the story and everybody who knows what, um, you know, what Sally and her group did. Um, it's up to all of us to really 
either learn to do our own cleaning or really value and respect cleaners. But I also wanted to be upbeat because in a sense, May did have a victory because yes. what, and she had, they had the victory by um, moving against the government and the Ministry of Defence, didn't they? Because there, the, I think the electricians unions did come in and support them. And suddenly the government, you know, they couldn't just get in. They didn't in those days, things were not contracted out so much and particularly with government workers. And when I think that that was when they got their increase in wages, wasn't it? From the equivalent of four pounds in today's money to maybe the equivalent of six or seven, but it, it was a significant victory. Um, it was Maggie, but, and I, you're absolutely right to make the positive statement, but that was 50 years ago. And when they lost the contract on the Ministry of Defense building, all those cleaners lost their jobs. So you have to do it again and again. Yeah. And in fact, that is what's been happening in, um, in cleaning in London, in the big universities and public buildings. There's been some success in organizing cleaners in the University of London, in Senate House, and in, you know, before the lockdown, it's all probably, you know, subsided a bit. But every generation has to, has to, uh, uh, grow up and learn about the value of trades unionism. And it certainly was easier in the 70s because trades unionism was a, as an integral part of cultural and political life. Whereas, as we know, since the 1980s and since, um, you know, Margaret Thatcher's onslaught onto, on, 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 on trades unions. Trades unions has ne have never quite regained their strength. But the TUC now, the Trades Union Congress now, is, is led by Frances O'Grady, a wonderful woman, and they're very mindful of organizing both women workers and migrant workers in the lowest paid jobs. Um, so it's a different kind of struggle. And you're right, people have to do it for themselves. They have to. Um. Um, Maggie, that, that idea of uh, and so on, presumably um, setting this story in 2016, rather than say, writing a story set in 1972, that must have been at the forefront of your mind about what had changed and the because often the, the point about struggles is there may not be a victory, uh, um, an immediate victory, but it, it lays the groundwork for the future. But as we've been discussing, I mean, the fact that major trades unions did not support the outsourced cleaners at LSE and that it was an upstart union that represented them and allowed them to win shows that people might not be going, oh, you're not very skilled, love, anymore, but they are still not supporting migrant workers. So, so it was a deliberate choice, I assume, to set it in 2016 rather than in 1972 to reflect on. It's also to do with what I like to do as a writer. And I'm really interested in trying to understand the present and the future. That's, what I, that's where, to me, it's that dangerous edge yeah. that really interests me because I'm, I'm not a historian and there's a lot of very good, very, very good historical fiction in this country, but I think not quite enough about the present and um, you know it, it interests me to give my own take on that I like to stick my neck out and try and do that um also as a writer I mean writers are really needing we're really needing our unions our organizations mm -hmm. and I suspect there's some academic here as well I know there I mean I know Sally of course but um I should think there's quite a few and we are needing our unions because you know we're all in. We're all in trouble too, and and you're not strong enough on your own. Um, and I, I've always done stuff for writers' rights um, because writers are very powerless, and it's getting harder for writers to get paid. And young writers, you know, if you're just starting, and publishers will probably be extremely nice to you, but still join the writers' unions because later on they might not be quite so nice. And it's extremely helpful to have you know, to have colleagues, to have people who are out there lobbying the government. Um, so join ALCS and the Society of Authors or Writers Guild, um, please. <laughs> Let's talk about how academics appear both in your story, Maggie, and Sally, in your incredible afterward. I mean, the 
the issue about cross-class solidarity, issues of voice. We have Irina thinking about needing the real voice, and then all of a sudden this, this, this bellowing older woman stops being othered and starts being useful. And of course, the line about writers having a sliver of ice in their heart may be true of, of academics as well. There's sort of, there is a part of that experience that can't help but be extractive. You know, uh, Irina having a, a cleaner, but, you know, writing about cleaners. I mean, how do you, how do you both as, as feminists and as academics reflect on how is it possible to be allies and to not usurp other people's struggles and voices um, using well, our, our job is to represent, I think. Um, I mean, sometimes it's to be out there, but um, I, I've always wanted to write about, yeah, I mean, my cleaner is a whole novel about the relationship, the power relationship between an employer and a cleaner. Um, both of them, as it happens, are writing. And this total lack of, they, they cannot see each other. And yet again, there is a moment where they do. And I do believe that hope is possible. I don't believe in institutions really, because they're always changing and they're always being undermined. But I do believe in people banding together through using imagination and empathy and thinking about their own lives. Um, a, a class in Britain is very complex because, you know, writers are middle class, of course we are. I went, you know, I, I went to Oxford. Um, I'm a novelist. I'm a professor. But actually, all my class loyalty comes from my family. And, you know, my grandparents and my aunts and my uncles, they were the people I grew up knowing. And that's where my emotional solidarity is. And you talk about the sliver of ice. I've not, never really been very good at the sliver of ice. I have to really <laughs> feel a subject, you know. And when I feel a subject, of course, the craft is very important. And the craft is what will make it work. But I think you do have to write about what you feel for. And I mean, but I'm really impressed. But you see, I want to say I, I'd like to know more about what, what did you think of Mayhop, Sally? You know, as a person. Um... Oh, oh, she was she was a force of nature. Um, she was she was a, 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 a an amazing woman. I don't know if you've ever seen film of her or um, you know she was very charismatic, very very charismatic, and just a, you know incredible energy. And and she and her husband were were I mean we were around all the time you know and the children and I had a daughter at the time you know my my daughter was was very little at the time and um, and we were it, it was very domestic our friendship and also very activist um, she was she was bold. She was resourceful, she was imaginative, she was wonderful at speaking to the cleaners and getting them to um, get, getting them to join and getting them to see the, the you know, I, you, you do begin, you do see the point of people who are charismatic and who are leaders, but also she could, you know, sort of get close with you and become, you know, talk to you quite intimately about your conditions. And I thought she was wonderful with the with the unions as well. But sometimes she would argue with them, and um, you know, I mean, the union leaders were very different. You know, the branch organizers, the local officers, the you know, the the difference between the skilled um, men and the um, general sectors of the unions. I mean, it was a transport and general workers union that she was working with. And as you say, it was in fact the, um, uh, what became the civil service union that was, um, what, what became as Thames was organizing uh, uh, the public, the Ministry of Defense building. So you had to change your arguments and uh, stance. And May was more than capable of doing that. She also worked very well with the other women and she didn't I mean there was a, there was a whole group of women who were very active and very good leaders 
But, you know, she was blacklisted. She couldn't get any employment. And um, they had children, and her husband was a part-time building worker, and he helped May all the time, and he had very ill health. And eventually they migrated to Australia. Yeah, and she ended up, as far as it's hard to trace her in Australia, but I think she ended up reading tarot cards. I think she did. She did. <laughs> she did. I met her son recently, one oh, of her sons. Yeah. And he told me lots about that. She, they, they did. I mean, she organised and she worked in the trade union movement, and they, and then they toured with the circus and they with with fairs and fairgrounds, and yes, she told fortunes. And I mean, they were the kind of people, you know, like many Londoners actually, and many big city dwellers. Um, you know, turn their hand to anything. I mean, you had to make money and you had to live, and there was no, no sort of um, feeling sorry for yourself, or you know, you just got on with it. And they were, and in that sense, I mean, the class difference was profound. I was not an academic in 1972. Um, I was a mature student, and um, but I'm, I, I was then, and I am now deeply privileged, you know, because I'm economically secure. Oh God, my battery is going to run out. I'll have to go down to the kitchen and put the what's it's in. Well, in uh, as you do that, um, Maggie, um, I I wonder about. Um, about Anna talking about, you know, um, should, should we be happy for her that she says, I do cleaning, but I'm not defined by it. I'm not a cleaner. And, and, and that she appears to have absorbed either as a defense mechanism or, or, or because she genuinely believes it, this kind of stuff about the gig economy and that it gives you freedom and choice. You know, you're an Uber driver, so you can choose how many suites to put in the front and get good reviews and therefore you have agency and who'd want to go back to a Fordist model. Um, that was like a little warning buried there, was it not? I mean, should we? Oh yeah. Do we believe there's any truth yeah, in what I she's saying? Is it good that she doesn't define herself as a cleaner? Oh no, no! I mean, I'm sort of gently ironizing her, but but um, we all got to tell a story about our life, haven't we? We've all got, we all have a version that is acceptable. She's dealing with this overpowering mother. Um, she is aware that she has. It, in the longer story, it's clearer that really um, she is she is a writer, but she somehow her life has gone slightly wrong as so many lives do. And there's still time for her to become what she wants to, but she has to find the courage to do it. And she should not be living at home with her mother. <laughs> her mother's a great woman, but they should not really be together. Um, and yet Kim and grandma, obviously the genes of the generation, um, it's, it's a difficult thing, writing about something. It's, I mean, Comer have done a great job by not just doing this, the, the two protest series, but they also did one that I loved that was about science and literature, and they got scientist and a writer. And I've always been fascinated by science. Um, and I contributed to that. And again, you see, I do think fiction, I can't separate art and life in this art has its rules and its form and its craft but i always wanted my writing to be part of my life and i'm a well because i'm alive i'm a political animal so i've always wanted the grist it could be science it could be politics but i wanted life in the stories and so i love this um i love um i love what comma are doing and i think short stories actually they have this chance to tell you something mm. about life, you know, and to be real. And I think fiction should be too, actually, to be honest, long fiction too. Uh, it is room for millions of different kinds of writers, but um, I just love what Comra are doing because I think they do see their role as political, as part of society, and they do see that literature and 
literature and society are not two separate things. Yes, I, I quite agree with you, Maggie. I think that's, in, you know, wonderful about comma. But I also love, it's extraordinary when you think about the story that you wrote that, and you think about lockdown now and COVID, when people are living, mothers and children are living together and families are back home because they can't go out and it, it, it there's something there that you that you touch on in that story that's very present in experience today isn't it of of um uh, sorry no i just i hope so i'm, I'm yes lovely lovely to think that and of course trump is gone yes <laughs> He's, he's gone, and that's terrific. So, you know, the bad things, lockdown will, we hope, end. And I, I, I never want to give, a, to give a story or a novel that doesn't have hope in it, you know, because that, that's a political act to me, to try and end. I agree. I agree. Incredibly poetic and ecstatic vision at the end, and that's where you see... Yeah. Obviously, Maggie's skill as a writer, you know, beginning from the pages of Vogue and the desire to be clean and tidy. And then at the end, the daringness of, of this, this kind of world encompassing view of tendrils and making things clean again. I thought it was an incredibly bold way to have this transported poetic vision of what cleaning could mean. Because I, I think many people who are who are fighting for justice um, wouldn't necessarily go to that place to, to, to make a case for the magic of cleaning. I, I think I'd be focusing on the wages of cleaning, but it seems as though... That's what Sally helped the Cleaners Action Group, you know, that they, that they did, but I'm trying to do something else and I'm allowed to imagine a world where things get better. But but can but Maggie, that's that's right. But also, so do you know? Just as you know, I mean, historically, that's also what trade union. You know, I think of Mary MacArthur, the organizer of the women's trade union, the National Federation of Women Workers in the early twentieth century, and she said, you know, women. I want to organize women. You know, I want to get wages up for women so that they have time to think, time for their imagination time for themselves you know and that's what we all want really and you you do it through fiction brilliantly but i don't know if you heard the wonderful uh contemporary historian selena todd speaking on start the week on monday and she's got a new book coming out called the myth of social mobility and she just ended up talking about you know, what enables people to rise out of poverty and improve their conditions and achieve what they want to achieve. And she said, you know, we should pay, and it was an image, not as poetic and beautiful as yours at the end of your story, but very powerful still. And it was an image of where she just said, you know, why can't we pay all the care workers you know, all the cleaners, all the people who do those kinds of necessary jobs, which make our life possible, what we pay bankers. And that was, that hope. Absolutely. It was very inspiring. Mm. Yes, I love that. I love that. Um, we, uh, we hope we come out of lockdown and we, yes. we carry with it the sense of who are the real heroes. Um, yes, indeed. exactly, exactly. Yeah. As we do our cleaning. <laughs> The issue about skilled and unskilled um, labour, you know, Sally, in your piece, talking about the union argument at the time that you should only organise people if they if they had an actual skill, that that's what, I mean, it sounds like a medieval guild, really, rather than yes. worker representation and and the idea of what, what is skilled and what is not. Of course, that's so salient now, the, the idea that um, perhaps that lockdown is at least making more people think about the fact uh, about what what is a key worker, what is essential work, that there's actually no low skilled work, there's only low paid work. And yes, obviously it's as essential when you think about women's work, but but more broadly. So that made me think again, 1972, 2016 in the story, but 2021 now, what is skilled labor? And 
Yes. And what do we value? I mean, that's that's something that a lot of, you know, economists and and historians and, you know, have been rethinking recently. What is, you know, what do we value? What work do we value? And how do we value it? And where does value come from anyway? You know, I won't, that's, those are very important philosophical as well as political questions. I, th I but, think it's also more widely, it's very difficult to value other people's work, anybody else's yeah. work. It, it, you know, until you've done it, you you really yeah. don't. And it's the same in lockdown, in yeah. with your partner or you know with your children. It's very hard to underestimate the work the other person's doing because you're very aware of what you're doing yourself. So there is a, a thing about imagining, um, and of course, what the media tends to foreground is a very limited number of jobs that are seen as glamorous and therefore there is a terrible amount of ignorance actually about what oh I think I was very ignorant about care homes you know yeah. I really did I'm afraid I'd slightly absorbed the, the narrative in the media about poor care homes you know the ones who get into the news and I was quite shocked and I'm wonderfully surprised when you know we saw principled passionate people working in care homes who were doing a terrific job, people who were running homes who obviously felt passionately proud of what they were doing, who were desperate to get the PPE in. And I just realized, you know, we're all blind. We're all blind about things. Um, and um, I suppose that's one thing literature can do really. It can try and open up some of those mysteries. But of course, it yes. only knows a few, you know, we, we just have to go out and try and find out more, I think. I think the other the other area of work which I think perhaps the lockdown has caused a revolution in the imagination is parents who realize how difficult it is to teach their children or to help their children. Perhaps there's been a reevaluation of teaching. I mean that that you know the you've heard I've heard so many parents in in the in the kind of interviews and so on just saying it's like so difficult <laughs> to do and uh, you know they can't wait for schools to come back so that they don't have to do it and that might be one of those imaginative leaps of empathy and identification with teachers that perhaps wasn't there before among many of us you know don't you think I think that's another moment of hope in this difficult situation today yeah, that, that is a really important one actually I, I, yeah. I because you know we've all been parents hearing the complaining at the gate and you just think yeah but there's 30 kids or there's 35 kids <laughs> not just your unjustly treated little whoever you know and you just think god it's hard what they do and I suppose I do know teachers and oh god it's hard and it I, is. they will be, I hope they'll be more appreciated and I hope they'll be valued and I hope people will do a bit more praising when yes. we can go back. Yes. Um, we've got some fantastic questions in the Q&A. So um, Sally and Maggie, if I, could, um, if I could be the interlocutor here and um, fish up some fantastic contributions for you to consider. Um, uh, Libby noted, uh, Maggie, of your story, um, what an amazing piece of writing, and it made her think about at what age children begin to learn more formally about politics and identity versus what they pick up on just by living, and would love to hear from both of you as, as um, former children, as grown-ups, as parents. <laughs> I love that for former children. It's, great. <laughs> it's still inside, of course. Um, I I don't know. I think you you do sort of imbibe it a bit with 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 your mother's milk. I mean, it was very difficult not to be labour in my family, and um, yeah. But on the other hand, I also imbibe nonsense, you know, because I wanted to read the papers. And even papers like the Herald, which was a socialist paper, there was so much about red, reds under the beds. I literally thought there were reds under the beds. 
people should actually need to talk to. In this story, Kim thinks Donna, Donald is a woman. She thinks there's a Donna Trump who is a murderer because all she hears is Donna Trump, Donna Trump. Um, so it, I think it's better to talk to kids myself. But obviously you don't want to worry them too much. So it's a balancing act, isn't it, Sally? Yeah. Um, I wasn't brought up in a in a socialist home. My father was a self-made man, as they used to say in the six, 50s and 60s, and um, he came from he came from the back streets of Reading. I was told, but they were. I mean, he he certainly voted conservative, and uh, and we. So I didn't, I didn't, but I, I grew up arguing with him. And um, gosh, I agree with you. I mean, you know, you, 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 you talk to your children and you explain, and my parents did. They were very, very liberal, very open. They, you know, they argued with me about, um, I was one of four children, but they, they, you know, they discussed everything with us. They had a completely open uh, attitude towards everything, very unusual, very unusual. And, um, and of course I did move to the left. I did move to the left when I went into the theater and, but before then really, you know, CND. And, and then, yes, I mean, it would be interesting if a child or grandchild, I mean, none of my grandchildren are Tory, so, I don't know what I'd do if they were. I expect you'd love them, probably. <laughs> Tories, aren't they? You know, it, it, and there's very bad socialists. So, um, but well, oh yes, no, there there are there are, and also there's this, great complexities because my father was a tremendous patriarch, and yet he gave me a tremendous bit of advice. Um, I saw somebody saying, I saw a little box saying, open age appropriate dialogue on the screen a little bit ago. So I don't know if, if that's us not being age appropriate or uh, anyway, what I want to say is something useful is that my father said, don't believe what anyone says. <laughs> yes. It's obviously mad that advice, but it's so useful just to take a moment not to believe it before you let yourself believe it. Because it's so easy to just soak up what the media throws at you or what Twitter throws at you. So it's really very useful not not to believe what you're told. Um, yes. I think writing Do you know, that's, that's funny, Maggie. My father used to say thing, that to me. You know, you've always got to question. You've always, you know, never take, never take something at face value. It's, it's very interesting that... Maybe they were, maybe my, fa my, my father was brought up in the 30s, my mother and my father. They were, you know, they were born, they were, well, anyway. They grew up in tremendous poverty. I think that's really what shaped them. Different kinds of poverty, but whereas we didn't, because I, you know, we were, my generation was, post-war and the welfare state and free schools and free medical, you know, care. And we didn't have those worries in the 40s and 50s. Um, what a great question. Gosh, I mean, I want to make a comparison with now, but I, I don't want, I won't. <laughs> well, it's, for me, it's hard not to have that feeling of how much has been lost. Because, yes. you know, if you grow up 1948, just when beverage and the National Health Service and yes. you know, the feeling you've been through a terrible war, now we must have free education. We're going to be more international in the way we look, you know, um, and great hope. Um, and it, it's very odd to see Thatcher's children and to see... You know, consumerism is both fascinating and riveting, and I rather like it because, you know, the 50s were very bleak, but also it's extraordinary, the levels of wealth that people have got used to. And maybe lockdown has, I certainly doing my tax return, I looked at what I had been spending on things like coffee, on travel, you know, not 
international travel actually, but just travel. Um, and I thought, you didn't need to spend that. Mm. Really didn't need to spend that. I discovered so many clothes during lockdown because I never throw anything away. I probably never need to buy any more clothes. <laughs> if I go in clothes shops, I might have to buy them. So I, maybe I don't need to go in clothes shops. I've got some, some wonderful other questions here. Um, Angelica has asked um, whether either of you have some more advice for young working class writers. Keep writing. Keep writing, keep writing. <laughs> and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because everybody gets rejected. And, um, you know, probably some of the books that ended up doing best of mine got rejected many times. You've just got to learn to be your own best critic and have writers who tell you the truth. But um, don't be afraid. It, it's, it's, um, there's nothing to lose, really. Uh, mm. I think it's hard um, if you're young and not confident or if you're old and not confident to um, approach people who might be able to give you some feedback. You know, people screwing up their courage in a bookshop to go up to an author they admire. The reason we ask for autographs is because we don't, <laughs> we don't quite have the nerve to ask for anything else. Um, what, would you, what would you say to the people who haven't got sharp, our sharp elbows but might benefit from writing to someone and saying, would you read this or asking for advice maybe from a teacher or for a friend or oh I, I well I mean I'm not a professional writer like Maggie because but I would definitely say that use your teachers I mean I say to my granddaughters you know use your teachers use them you know that's what they're there for so and and for the ones who would like to write or indeed whatever they want to do you know, surround yourself with people who who will encourage you and who will um, uh, believe in your writing and um, or whatever whatever the skill is that you're wanting to develop. But writing, particularly, read, 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 read is the other thing I'd say. Maggie, what made you believe that um, you could be a writer? Obviously, you uh, you know went to university, and um, a bit of writing is required. Um, but to go from university work to publishing books type work, what was? It didn't really happen like that. I wrote as a child. I always wrote things. I wrote poetry, um, and I still love poetry. Uh, read. I, yeah, I agree with Sally. Everything that Sally said, but I also think. Sharp elbows, I find desperately off-putting, mm. you know, uh, but it's a different thing if somebody comes and asks you a real question and we're all very open to people who want to ask us the question because they've read our work and they actually have a reason to ask us. And first respect the person you're asking and then yeah. ask the question. Um, because, you know, I don't know about Sally, but all the writers I know are actually very, very busy. So it's very hard to read, you know, because we read professionally, because I read, you know, for Bath Spa University. Um, and sometimes publishers send me things to read. Um, and I read things from my friends. So it's hard to take on other things, but I am always open to somebody who um, has an interest in something that I've done. And, you know, then once, wants advice, you know, genuinely wants advice. And if I think they're a good writer, um, the, the very difficult thing, to be honest, as someone who teaches writing, is that sometimes people who I think and know are really brilliant are not getting the success. And mm. others who are much less good are getting the success. But that's what encourages me to say, just go on and do it as well as you yeah. can. Because the yeah. market is the market. And if you start believing in the market, you're done for. Yeah. I have a great question here from Kelly. Um, sometimes small acts of oppression feel too difficult to challenge. So what do you both feel people can enact now to feel brave enough to challenge? One of my students today, says Kelly, said they didn't want to get anyone into trouble in a situation of sexism in the workplace now in the 21st century. So how can we help people feel brave enough to challenge? It's very hard to do it on the spot. 
uh, I mean, you get better as you get older. You, you, you're sort of more primed for it, I think. But um, And there are different ways of doing it, aren't there? But nobody gets it right all the time. No. And maybe sometimes you just learn from something and you think, next time I won't let that happen. Or um, And you can't challenge everything. You get knackered. I mean, Mara is a very tiring person in that story. You know, <laughs> she's, she's great, but she's exhausting. So I, I think the main thing is not to give yourself too harder time if sometimes you fail to defend yourself or support yourself because everybody fails and just come back and do it better the next time gosh i think that's i think that's very very interesting what you just said maggie that sometimes people who do challenge everything are exhausting they're exhausting to be around and it's exhausting for yourself and you at a certain point you have to say do i want to you know what, who's gaining from, from uh, you know, this rage and anger all the time? But um, picking your moments, and you do get better at that. Courage, courage comes from... Oh, God, I don't know. Sometimes impetuosity. Yes. But quite often think, stepping back and thinking about what's just happened and why. Also, sometimes I think, you know, we all want not to be angry, but temper sometimes, you know, I think maybe yeah. it's at her far side. And um, sometimes things are just so obviously unjust or you see an injustice. And then you do, you know, it's lucky because it spurs you to do something, but you do have to also protect yourself and protect, you, you know, we've, it, it's, um, it's a balancing act, isn't it? And writing is a space where we all have a bit of room. Everybody fails in real life because it happens so fast and you're never prepared. Whereas writing is this wonderful space that you, where you can make things more just. And you can let everybody breathe, even Irena. Irena, I tried to let her breathe. She's a bit less sympathetic in the story, actually. But she's not a bad woman. She's just limited by her background and her assumptions. And uh, she doesn't realize how much money she's got. Money makes people unimaginative. Lots of people are, we're all sort of slightly mad in different ways about money, I think. Yeah. yeah. But that, that line that uh, I think we've all heard so many times from Fortunate. We were, we were lucky, you know, <laughs> that sort of, <laughs> yeah, we were loaded actually. <laughs> um, but that, um, that, that, that tactful, classy way of saying <laughs> that you're living on ill-gotten gains. Um, but she did seem very human to me. Um, there's a question from someone named Secret Santa um, um, that sort of touches on this. Um, uh, oh, oh no, wait, sorry, anonymous attendee. Uh, Irena in the story reminded me a lot of the recent debate where left-wing feminist journalists were writing columns justifying keeping their cleaners working during the pandemic. How much do you think this shows support for cleaners as lip service as opposed to genuine cross-class solidarity? I mean, this touches on the story, doesn't it? And, and... Well, I didn't read the, that, I didn't actually read that article so I don't know what I would make of it. What I mean is that, it, it, um, that, that issue that the yes. attendee has raised makes me think of, of you know Irina is helping is paying a little over the odds um, and and defends it. Is it genuine solidarity or is it just being a bit lazy? She's not black and white because there's a moment in the real story is you know the full story where um, she has to make a decision how much to give away and you see her calculating. And first she's being so emotional, she wants to give a huge amount, and then she gives a bit less. And then she thinks, well, no, it would spoil them. I'll just give this much. And it's those little acts where we have to sort of catch ourselves, I think. Um, but, but I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm not, I am not a saint, because although I've been a cleaner, I've also had a cleaner for a long time. Um, and I did pay her and not have her work during lockdown. Um, but, um, and the title of my novel, My Cleaner, was a joke because everybody says my cleaner. They're not their cleaner. They are a cleaner who works for lots and lots of different people. And it's like the way 
in Africa, white people say my driver, and he's never their driver or very rarely their driver. Um, but yeah, yeah, so no, nobody's, you know, we just have to think about those intimate relationships, intimate power relationships with, with one's partner, with one's kids and with one's cleaner. They're, they're hot stuff for fiction. Um, and then there's all the stuff in society where, you know, people like Sally have given such a great lead and has have written so intelligently and done so much work. I mean, I look at nonfiction writing, I think it's harder. You can't be wrong. Well, but, you know. uh, well I, uh, I do want to just say one, make one point. I didn't read the article either. And I sort of missed the beginning of what the question was, but I think the question was about the hypocrisy of women who who say that they pay their cleaners through lockdown as if... Um, let me just go back. Um, the, the person who's contributed here says that Irena, in the story, in, in your story, reminds, oh. says the writer, a lot of the recent debate where left-wing feminist journalists have been writing columns justifying keeping their cleaners working during the pandemic. So in other words, having them in their house cleaning. And, and how much do you think this is a question of showing support for cleaners or uh, um, j is just lip service or is it genuine cross-class solidarity? Like I continue to give her work and it's good that she's coming in. I mean, there are all those issues about Well, women. can I just, yes, I want to reply to that point. Yes. While we live in this messy, awful, you know, unequal world, I think that there is a lot there's something to be said for uh, keeping cleaners uh, employed during the lockdown, paying them extremely well, giving them sick pay, absent pay, all the conditions that professional women would expect themselves. I don't think one should, um, I mean, those are old trade union values that you pay a proper wage for proper work and you pay when there's any interruption which is unforeseen. I do agree with that. And I know enough cleaners, and I've also done cleaning like every young person almost, you know, I did childminding and cleaning and waitressing when I was young. But of course, I've not had to do it as an adult. So I'm not, I'm not, claiming solidarity there, but I do know cleaners and I know they want the work, they want good work, that's well paid, fits in with the kids, um, fits in with the rest of their commitments. And, and sometimes they really enjoy the work. Like one of the women, women that I organized, a woman called Viv Kelly, she worked for years at Peter Jones as a cleaner during the day when her children had grown up. It was like a whole different job from working at nights when her kids were young and her husband didn't have a good job, you know? And um, and the and the conditions were good and she got sick, pay, et cetera. Those, so I'm in favor of paying your cleaners. And as long as you pay them when they can't come, you pay their fares, you pay the, for the meals, you give them, you make them work a 45 minute hour, like trade union hours, you know, et cetera. There's a lot to be said for that. Can I tell a story about Doris Lessing? Because it shows a wonderful side of Doris Lessing. People sometimes think she was very tough. But um, when I was sort of struggling, I got a youngish child and, you know, lots and lots of work. And she came to supper. I was just starting to make friends with her, very overawed. And she sort of picked up that I was a bit worried about this cleaning thing. And she actually... <laughs> volunteered she said oh I'm going to pay my I mean this was afterwards she was a serious offer I'm going to pay my cleaner to come around and work at your house I'll send her there in a taxi of course I could tell her I mean it was so kind of her she, she was very imaginative she was someone who made a lot of money and then really did like Samuel Beckett she really did try and use her money in a good way yes it's slightly comic but I just thought it was wonderful just the fact that she offered yes you feel less harassed you know yes exactly and that she was going to do it properly and pay properly and pay very well <laughs> yeah that's right 
Um, we've got just a few a few more minutes to um, to continue imposing on you both. This has been such a great conversation. There have been wonderful comments in the chat as well as in the Q and A. Um, many people pointing out how many unions there are at the moment doing doing great work. A lot of the new unions like IWGB, yeah. uh, W, um, and of course, as you know, um, Sally, you pointed out in in. In your piece, although there were some union leaders who were intransigent or not supportive of the women, there were others who, who showed incredible solidarity. The young man representative who drove up in his sports car to, <laughs> to support, maybe too young to have heard he wasn't supposed to be doing this. Um, so there are all kinds of examples of, of solidarity and it's so heartening to see so many people contributing that. Um, but just to, um, and, and also in the Q&A here, IWGB, one of our contributors say, we're able to represent sectors of the economy that maybe some traditional trade unions weren't able to reach. Yeah. Um, but uh, a question from um, Lindsay, who asks both of you, um, in your opinion, um, you know, why has nothing changed? Or, or perhaps you, you, might, you might say that's, that's that's not actually the case, but you know, in that the low pay, bad conditions, unfair contracts, they're still rife, even though without cleaners, London would grind to a halt. I mean, yeah. do, do you have any thoughts? Is it because it's largely women and migrants work or have there been gains? Um, is it, this, is a, this is a question specifically about, about cleaners, isn't it? Um, and, probably about all kinds of low skilled workers. Um, it's unacceptable. It's a huge structural thing. Um, I think start at home. I think what Sally said about, you know, if you, if you do have a cleaner and they, whatever decision you make, then respect them, be aware of how hard the work is. I mean, what um, Helen used to do in three hours, it takes me about three days to do. Mm -hmm. And that's given me a huge respect. I mean, I had it before, you know, because it's something I think about. Um, but I don't think in general, I wouldn't say, I think there's been a huge and terrible shift towards um, Globe Corps and you know, huge entities like Google and um, Facebook. And, you know, that is terrifying. But in terms of how, uh, how people of color, women, gay people in my life, which has lasted since 1948, things have got massively better at an individual level. So while these huge structural things have been going on pretty bad, um, I'm still going to be grateful for the sorts of respect that are now given to people who were not getting it in the 50s when I was a kid. Um, yeah. Gosh, that's a really difficult one. I think that there are between five and six million people now in the UK living on the gig economy. You know, the gap between rich and poor is so much bigger than it used to be when we were growing up in the 40s and 50s. I'm, I'm a, you know, I was born in 43. Um, you know, what is, I wish I had the statistic to hand, but whereas the, you know, the top pay in the 60s and 70s was, I don't know what, you know, 10 times the lowest paid. Today, it's something like, you know, 700 times as much as the lowest paid. So inequality has got much, much, much wider and bigger economic inequality uh, than it was when we were young, because there was a welfare state and there was a will to improve people's lives. Um, But that's, yes, I mean, those of us, those of us who have benefited have benefited. I don't know. I don't know. I just think that people should be paid much more. The, the lowest paid and the least valued work should be paid much more. And I remember once when my children were young, um, 
and they were you know local comprehensive school one of the one of the um uh, you know, government inspectors of schools said to me at a parent governor's meeting, you know, there's nothing wrong with the teaching profession that, you know, halving the class sizes and doubling the wage, this was in the uh, um, 80s, wouldn't improve, you know, and that's, I still sort of have that attitude, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you about the big things. I'm just saying that there are certain kinds of cruelty that were very, in, in the UK, that were everywhere. Yes. In the 50s that are, are no longer acceptable. Um, yes. And that, I think, is something to be glad for. Um, and the other things, as a writer, I just think I'm going to write about it. You know, write about the inequality and the... Um, yes. You know. You do that, Maggie. You do that. <laughs> You know, and all the young writers who are listening, you know, just go for it. Um, and you know, your vision is is your vision, and yes. if it's not the same as the color supplements, great, great. There are some wonderful, wonderful writings about about class, and I mean, uh, there are some marvelous, marvelous portraits of the world we're living in, really, on television and in literature aren't there they're just masses of stuff gives me hope there is hope in books um but i would yes. say we are in a houseman's evening um i would love to keep you both here forever um that we have still hundreds of people who who are here listening and i just wanted to say thank you so so much to sally to maggie to maxine um, for making this a wonderful evening, to Mama Press for putting these these really really great books together, um, to everybody who's joined us, um, to Becca, Zoe, and Ra from Comma Press, and um, to of course all my colleagues at Housemans. And please, for all of you, um, have a look at the Housemans website. Um, we are selling books. We're selling wonderful books, thousands of books. Um, and having events like this, um, I, spending an evening in the company of three such thoughtful women and all of you out there, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, lovely to meet you, Sally. Yes, and you, Maggie. Wonderful. I'm a big fan of yours, Maggie, so oh, it's great. <laughs> Thank you. And we're all fans of Housemans and Commerce, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Christopher Eccleston called it the best bookshop in the world last night. So we're all tattooed, stitching that into our pillowcases. Oh, that's wonderful. It is. It is certainly one of the best. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.